Hello, gentlemen. How's everyone doing? Doing great. Hanging it's in spectacular. there. We're not, not not everyone at once here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was like waiting for other people to jump in yeah. there. You know, Pete. Don't want to. Yeah, I love how like Jeff. Is, Jeff is so Jeff. You're on like the roof of Fenway Park right now. Is that that's kind of what's going on here? Yeah, it's unfortunately it's not a very good place to be right now. Um, but you know, I'm hanging out, and we're we're gonna get through the summer hopefully. Nice, I I I, uh, I like it. Um, hey everyone, thank you for joining us for this um, this fantastic event on how to scale your revenue org. Um, we've got a bunch of really fabulous experts here today who you'll learn a little bit more about here in a second. Uh, Jeff and Jeremy Ross and I are here for more emotional support. Um, you know, as compared to the real the real experts. But while while folks are kind of joining here, um, thought we could. Um, would love to know if you guys have any kind of like travel coming up or uh, you know trips that you've taken recently that maybe you could uh, could share while while people are kind of like trickling in for the the main event. So um, I I my company actually had a, a, a retreat in Hawaii a couple of weeks ago. Uh, wow. I'll come to the retreat. And I <laughs> most of these people, so it's pretty cool. And then uh, got to go to Napa Valley after that for a weekend, which was more of a <laughs> personal thing. Oh, uh, I was like. <laughs> This is like a movable feast of like yeah. the. It's like a company retreat that is has like multiple legs to it. That sounds uh, that sounds pretty delightful. Um, Jeremy, what about you? You've been up to you've been on a plane recently, uh, bouncing around. Just got back from Costa Rica. Oh wow! Um, so I was there for a week. So that was amazing. Had never been to Central America, um, but this is also the year of weddings. Um, oh, so I think we're on our fourth now, and we have Damn. two more. To make it yeah to kind of book in the summer there there you go what was the coolest thing you saw in costa rica um monkeys monkeys Just the, yeah the, the monkeys in the trees yeah they're everywhere like a, a yeah pod of 20 with like six babies it was yeah amazing uh, bananas what about you ross you've been you've been bouncing around i was told that um coming to san francisco for client meetings doesn't count as fun travels so i said uh, it counts have... <laughs> sorry you did <laughs> i said that it didn't count but yes um, I recently moved back to my hometown, Toronto last year, but it's back in San Francisco right now. I'm actually in the atrium office taking That's this right. call right now. So You're it's very meta. Stealing Wi-Fi, stealing <laughs> Wi-Fi, stealing, stealing Wi-Fi, stealing Wi-Fi, stealing, don't worry. It's all I, about, I, I heard it's, I yeah, it's all about leverage I, right now and efficiency. So here we I go. Ca I, ca I counted our coffee mugs. Okay. So just FYI. Just don't get any, don't get any bright ideas. Um, wonderful. Well, um, we can get jam in here. So thanks everybody for, um, for joining us. Um, I'm really excited. This is a topic that's like super near and dear to my, um, to my heart here. Um, we're talking about scaling, scaling your revenue organization. We have two really fantastic guests who, um, you know, are experts in their own right. A um, little bit like we'll get into a little bit more here in a second, but you know, Jeff is a very, you know, a very, um, uh, tenured early stage sales leader um, who, you know, who really kind of uh, executes best in that kind of like early stage environment where like you get zero, one, two, three, et cetera reps. And like Jeremy's been around the block and kind of seen larger growth. He's at Sendoso right now, which has, I want to say like 30, 40, 50 sellers or whatever. We are, we are huge Sendoso fans because we like to send things to people because we have fun things to, to send around um, as a former product marketer. Um, but yeah, super fantastic event that we're going to have today. These are the topics we're going to go through here. Really kind of these idea of like the stepwise um, kind of times in your, in your organization's growth as a, or maturity of a sales organization. So, you know, proof of concept originally with around, you know, that kind of like zero to one time, um, then getting to the point where you can prove success of teams, teams, and then, um, and then getting to a secondary additional layers of management where you start getting to the point where you have like so many reps that like, you know, you can't keep them all in your brain, et cetera. Um, so those are gonna be the topics that we're gonna be going through here. Let's do a little bit of uh, introductions here. Um, 
what I can do is I can just introduce myself really quickly to get that out of the way. Um, I'm Pete Kazanji. I am one of the founders and the CRO of Atrium. Uh, Atrium makes data-driven sales management software that um, helps sales managers, so AESDR, AM, CSM managers use metrics and data to improve rep performance. So we like to think of ourselves as the sales nerd squad here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we can kind of just go um, left to right here. So Mr. Ross, uh, you want to uh, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah. So Ross Ridge, CEO and co-founder of Accord. Um, Accord is a customer facing workspace for B2B sales and onboarding, where you can basically create a shared space between buyers and sellers to better collaborate on sales and onboarding, make it more transparent, engaging, build accountability on both sides. Um, yeah. Excited to be with this uh, awesome crew and hope some great companies here. Yeah, we are, we are here at Atrium. We are big uh, Accord homers. Um, we use the, like all, all 15 of my account executives are, um, you know, honorary accordions. I don't know. What, what yeah. do you guys call your customers? You call your, your staff accordions. You know, Oof, name for your customers. That's actually a really good question. We are accord homers for sure. Um, <laughs> Jeremy, you want to introduce, uh, introduce yourself? Yeah. My name is Jeremy Carso. <clears throat> um, I'm head of revenue enablement at Sendoso, um, which in the simplest is a gifting platform, but we really like to put human in there. Um, oh, yeah. So really, just creating human experiences um, through gifts. Yeah, we we love 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 love. Did I say we love Sendoso um, here at Atrium? Like we just we as a former product marketer, I just like we just send like all sorts of things to people all the time, like materials and and like Yetis and and coffee mugs and what have you. Uh, it's just absolutely embedded in our in our inbound motion in a very you know in a very and actually our outbound motion um as well in a very very meaningful way so um awesome to have you here uh jeremy uh, and also uh Sindos is a longtime atrium customer as as well from the time when they uh you know only had like five reps and and uh you know kind of scaled up there and then jeff um maybe you can introduce yourself um from the roof of fenway park there Sure. Uh, so Jeff Kerchick, I'm in go-to-market strategy at Able, which is an emerging fintech company focused on automation for commercial lenders. Uh, previously was VP of sales for a Y Combinator startup for like eight years that was acquired last March. Um, and um, author of Authentic Selling, How to Use the Principles of Sales in Everyday Life. Uh, so very passionate about, you know, authenticity and, you know, SDR stuff as well. So really excited to be here. Uh, really, really smart group of people. Um, so I'm looking forward to bouncing ideas off you in the spirit of continuing uh, what you guys have been talking about with the great solutions here. I'm a big fan of uh, Atrium, Accord, and Sendoso. So uh, on <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Convenient. Look at that. Um, awesome. I totally forgot about your book, man. I, it, if I it's at home. It's it's on my. I have my sales book shelf at uh at at our place. I should I, I should have it like here so I can do like my book and your book and just be like la 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 la. And then moreover, what we should do, we definitely should do like an, a session with you and Todd Capone, who has a new book coming out on the transparent sales leader. So obviously, transparency and authenticity are you know kind of like chocolate and peanut butter, yin and yang, uh, etc. So we should definitely. Thing. Yeah, exactly. We we definitely should uh, should do that. Yeah, we're going to be doing an event with Todd coming up. And um, I've re read the transparent uh, transparency sale. Of course, is fantastic. But I'm looking forward to the transparency uh, sales leader. Cool. So um, so these are the topics that we're going to be talking about to today. Um, just kind of give folks a little bit of a preview. It's kind of like the stages of the organization. So you know, first step, we're going to be talking about like how can you you know, what are the most important things to focus in on when you're kind of proving that initial um, sales motion, like <laughs> the seeds as we have our nice little iconography here. Um, then we'll move into talk how to, um, you know, make a team of teams and make sure that you've got like, you know, that initial abstraction and that that's actually working. And then um, how do you then scale that up? Um, above and beyond that. So those are the topics we'll we'll kind of get through here. So let's get into the first one here, um, which we kind of like, uh, you guys will appreciate these kind of like booty slides that we'll go through here. Um, they, they come from a deck that that I present quite a bit um, alongside founding sales. But the first kind of topic is how can we, um, you know, build a, um, you know, build a mini, uh, a mini sales team. And so what we mean by a mini sales team is um, if we go to the next slide here, um, 
kind of like something that looks like this, right? Where you have an initial, maybe like something that looks like sales development rep, maybe a couple of account executives, maybe a customer success manager where you have this, and like maybe that's being overseen by you know, either a business founder or maybe an early, um, uh, an early sales leader. Um, but this is kind of the stage that we're talking about um, here. And, and so I think, um, you know, if you go to the next slide here, um, these are kind of like the biggest topics that like um, kind of pop out there. And so I think that kind of the, the first thing would be, you know, um, in the spirit of, um, you know, avoiding premature uh, scale, how do you really know that it's time for that phase? Right to to like build this initial kind of like mini sales team, and I think uh, Jeff, maybe we can kind of start with you, like how you know that it's ready, like it's time to to kind of like add a couple of more folks, add a couple more sellers, et cetera, like that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm kind of taking here from Mark Roberge, uh, you know, a former CRO of HubSpot, author of the Sales Acceleration Formula, one of the more prominent thinkers within our space, but big believer in, in what he has to say, there's really like kind of three buckets that you need to traverse in order to get to this stage. First is the product market fit stage. The second is the go-to-market fit stage. And then the third is the, the scale stage, right? Um, there's a kind of a big, a, maybe a misconception about what you should be doing when you're starting a company and like what your first sales rep should look like. Your first sales rep should be good at sales, but they re really should also be an extension of the product team. In a way, they're almost like a product manager. They're, 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 they're the they're the boots on the ground that are getting you all the information you need to, you know, talk about you know, to the, to the, to the product team, the founder and so on about what you need to be doing. Yep. They're the ones who are talking to customers. Um, <laughs> so initially what you need is to figure out if you have product market fit, um, you sign up some customers, you try to understand what are the leading indicators of retention. Um, the big mistake here is not to be focused on revenue. Anybody can get from zero to five or 10 million with snake oil. You need something that's <laughs> scalable, right? So you need to you need to have proof that you have retention, and that's how you have product market fit. From there, you go to market, you start selling, you try to figure out the best way to sell into the market until you achieve the unit economics that allow you to scale, which is where you get to that third phase, the scale phase. Um, so it's I'd say if I were to you know could obviously go on about this, Pete, but condensing it, those are the three things that you need to be focused on. Once you have, uh, let's say like an LTV to CAC ratio of something like three to five to one or greater, um, you're in position to start putting some gas on the fire. Yeah. Ross, what do you, I mean, I know that you guys work with a lot of um, early stage um, mm -hmm. organizations. Um, where do you kind of see that it's time to kind of like build a mini sales team here? And like, what are the most important things to kind of like look out for there? Yeah, I think um, maybe first qualitatively, then quantitatively. First, I think it's the ability to move from a founder-led sale to having one or two, ideally two reps, be able to close at a win rate that is very close to what that founder was able to do, maybe even higher because you get those reps in, you get to really focus in on um, kind of a core talk track and motion that you might not be able to do as that, that first seller as a founder. So I think that's the first thing is, can someone else replicate? A lot of times people would want to talk to the founder, you have a strong network, make sure that's not the thing, that it's the product and it's the problem that you're solving with this promise solution right. that will actually have people part with money and be excited about onboarding. So I think that's the first one. Second, can you onboard and activate them? Successfully, I think that this is a sure. part that is really missed. And I know yep. Pete and other folks on the call, um, you know, are kind of thinking about things in this more kind of next level way of like, okay, early on, obviously ARR, validation, all these things. But before you can really start to scale up the team, you want to make sure that you not just have a problem that you can get people to have a conversation with, close to get some money and have this product that they're excited about but well, are they actually going to use it to fulfill the value that you've promised and potentially have those end users at the company use the thing? So that's kind of the second qualitative piece. Yep. And, then, um, and then lastly, can you, I think this is a part that I've learned through my experience. Can you have a team that isn't also mainly run by someone's so like having that kind of team lead type person help carry those other folks? Like, I think you're ready to build that team when you have kind of those key components in place. And then quantitatively, kind of like what Jeff alluded to, I think something that we really look at, maybe less so some of the LTV and CAC pieces, but more so, hey, like, what could the quota be per um, per month, per quarter? Per seller. Something yeah. that, yeah, like 
obviously the goal is to be in that four to five X what you're paying someone, right? So, Hey, maybe you're paying reps depends on the type of deal. Maybe it's like a lower bid market deal. You're paying around, you know, 140, 150 K can they produce four X of that? And can you see that over multiple quarters? I want to make sure that those first two reps or three reps can get close to probably at least that three, three X yeah. before you really layer things on. I think people can get really excited about like, you know, like us, like, Hey, we're going to increase our ACV. We're going to be able to land and expand, but like, Hey, can you actually do that? I yeah. think people get really excited about the promise. And then you're in a position where maybe you have five sellers, a leader, all these things, and maybe it's not there. And maybe you need iterations. It's yeah. really hard to do that with a group of folks versus one or two really smart, those early adaptable reps and yourself being on the ground. Um, and I've seen that happen kind of time and time again, and then having to take the step back and then do it again. And I think that's really challenging versus yeah. maybe taking it that extra quarter a bit slower. You know, obviously you want to be ramping, obviously you want to be growing your team and it's exciting because things are working, but really slowing down to speed up. So those are some of the things that I think about and I've seen in terms of building this, this initial mini sales organization, but curious to get Jeremy's take on this as well. Yeah, Jeremy. Thanks, Ross. Um, what's your, I know Jeremy, you've worked for a number of like, you know, um, more scaled sales organizations, but I imagine you've probably seen, you know, maybe you've maybe come into organizations where this has maybe been like prematurely scaled or, or kind of seen things kind of like after the, after the fact, what do you think is really the hallmarks of like, okay, this organization is ready to get to, you know, two, three, four reps to, to start. Yeah. Um, I, I, I love to think about the the smaller organizations and my last company before Sendoso was 13 people. Oh, there you go. Um, and I always hey. love to think about my bartending days. Um, I worked at oh, TGI Fridays hey. during college and we had a square <laughs> bar um, and it was called a bump and run. Once you run into the other and bump into the other bartender, you turn the other way. So in uh, scaling, I always like to make sure that the team can do a little bit of everything. So kind of piggybacking off of what Jeff says, that product marketer. But mm. if you start looking at things that are cracking like and flexing, like you have to go to that business development stage, um, start looking at those. Like, why are we spending so much time to try to fill the funnel for an AE to have a more productive conversation? And what are you taking away? Like, if they're not having these sales conversations, what are we giving up in that point? So looking for those cracks. Um, and also I saw this in uh, Jeff's notes, but document everything. Like oh, just, gosh, just continue yes. to document everything. And yep. ask the, if then, if this, then what? Like, if we do this, can we come up with a hypothesis? If we put an AE in there and then two SDRs, what does that do? So mm -hmm. really looking at how to scale as opposed to just the generic, we need to grow, but really how, how many more conversations can that AE have if we're taking some of the, the lift out of the front end? Yeah, I love the documentation point because one of the things that I um, I talked about this in kind of the earlier parts of, of founding sales is around um, how like very, very early on what you're doing is your, your sales motion can kind of be thought of as like kind of like software a little bit, right? Or like, or a recipe. And what you're doing is you're, you know, before you're at the this, this size of organization as like either an individual founder seller or, you know, maybe a single, like a pioneer kind of like sales leader or whatever, like really what you're doing is you're creating the recipe. And so while you're creating that recipe and you're kind of like tasting it and you're like, Ooh, that doesn't work. Or like, you know, Oh, he closed lost thing. Not good. Mm -hmm. Um, like you're iterating, 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 but when you find the magical thing, when like when you find the route through the forest, what you have to do is you have to make sure that it's like well documented. Um, and so because then what you're going to do is like you're going to take that documentation, like even conceptually document it. Like we need to know the path through the forest. And then what we're going to do is we're going to document the hell out of that, um, whether it's in like playbooking software, right, or even just like a Google Doc, because that's going to just make it so much more uh, like so much easier for those incremental reps to be like, cool, here you are. Like, here's your swim lane right here versus like, all right, we're going to throw you into like the Pacific ocean and like have fun, yeah. right. Figure it out versus just like, here you go swim. Um, and that's a yeah. really important thing to do is just to, like, make sure that you're like, if you if you have that repeatability there, make sure that you're kind of like documenting as you go for your own benefit, but then also for the people that come behind you. And then the second thing I, I would think about 
um, that is kind of like maybe more data driven in its regard is understanding like, okay, cool. Like my win rate is at the point where I think we can like start like the path, through, the path through the forest has been found sufficiently as indicated by this like reasonable win rate. And so maybe what that is, is that's like, you know, 15, 20, 25, 30% of first meetings eventually turning into turning into a deal. Um, because if you're under that, like you probably haven't figured out the path through the forest. And so then adding a bunch of additional account executives to like also be lost in the forest is probably not a very useful thing. So those would be two things that I would kind of think about um, like that kind of indicate to you that like you're ready to you're ready to rock in that regard. Um, yeah, one, before we move on, yeah, Pete, I maybe you're gonna jump to this too, but uh, yeah, we've got a great question um, from Charlie about, can you expand on document everything, Jeremy? I think it might be helpful to hear some like tactical examples that I know um, probably Jeff and Pete, you have your own. This is what we're also looking to do at Accord as we're scaling. What do those things really look like? So like we talked about, okay, you're learning these things, your, your win rates are going up, you have a couple folks there. How do you help get to the next group of, of people as well as just kind of like squarely say concretely, this is how we get customers to success through these wins. What does that look like? Um, Jeremy, you know, my sharing some examples of stuff that you've done at previous companies or maybe now at Sendoso that have been really effective for reps to actually look at, because that's the big, that's the big thing, right? right? Like you could be documenting this stuff, but like, unless people are really using it, um, what is, yeah, what are a couple of those examples look like? Yeah. And that's, that's a pain point. I think at various stages is just where to find that and why is it useful <clears throat> at the beginning stages? If you're documenting everything, then you can start coming up with some of those journeys, like continuing that same sales language all the way through your funnel. Um, what is that? You're not going to get it right at the beginning. Like you're looking for that product market fit. Um, but if you're not documenting to learn from each of those, um, it's also being vulnerable and making sure that you're expanding on every time you stub your toe. Like, why did we stub your toe? Sure. Is the whole thing garbage or? Let's not, let's not do it again. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you, you need to create that safety for people to start having those conversations of, wow, I just completely bombed this call. Great. That's awesome. Let's, let's get in there and learn why so that we can start documenting of what not to do, um, which leads to more of those to do um, type motions that we want. Yeah. I, when you say document things, Ross, I'm like, you know, Google doc of disco questions, right? Like script, for, you know, script for slides, script for demo, like just bullet, like every single kind of like one of those things, like what are the behaviors that you need to do in your sales motion? Like we have a discovery mm -hmm. conversation. Where do you slides. put those? Where do you put those? I think that's the other question too that I have that I've struggled well, I think, with. Yeah, the MB companies is like yeah. actually yeah. making sure they're fresh and people engage with yeah. them because it's a yeah. lot of time yeah. to invest. Yeah, you just want to make, I mean, the MVP of that, in my opinion, is like a Google Doc or, or Notion or whatever. And then like later on, because it's like very agile. And then later, like I'll, I'll use us as an example. Like we have all, like our sales motion is encoded, enc encoded, encoded in an accord um, with like hyperlinks out to the, like, re like to relevant assets. Like we don't put the text per se in there. Like there might be some, but then it hyperlinks out to, you yep. know, the, the kind of like evergreen, the evergreen assets and what have you. Um, Wonderful. Well, um, got to keep moving here. So let's go to the kind of the next stage here. So what, um, because obviously we're here to, to scale things up. And I think the big, the kind of next thing is like, okay, how do you know that you're ready? And, you know, what are the biggest things to be, to be mindful of when you're like maxing out that initial team? Right. And so what that kind of, again, this is like a conceptual org chart here, right? So whereas before we had like a couple of account executives and an SDR and a CSM, like now we're getting like, we have like multiple groups, right? Like pods, if you will. And um, and this is gonna like add some more chaos, <laughs> right? But it's gonna add more, more barrels that you can, you know, the number of customer facing meetings that you're able to execute is, uh, you know, 3X compared to what you would have had in the, the prior um, in the prior situation uh, there, and so I think the the kind of the this is the point at which you're starting to get that to that initial scale, and this is the size of like sales organization that can take you through like you know one or two million dollar depending on a ASP like one or two million dollars of of ARR 
Um, kind of same topics here. Um, you know, what are the like? How do you know that it's you're ready to go to to this to this stage right here? And what should you look out for? And so, you know, Jeremy, I would imagine as somebody who's like an enablement, um, you know, an enablement pro. Oftentimes, you're being brought into an organization that's maybe at this at this stage. It, for forward-thinking organizations, I think it would be wonderful if everyone got like enablement resources when you have like a dozen, a, you know, a dozen sellers or what have you. Um, how do you know what you're you're ready to, you know, scale up that initial, you know, two to account executives to the point where like now you can say like, okay, cool, let's let's get to six or let's get to eight, right? What are the um, you know what are the hallmarks there? What are the things to kind of look out for? Yeah, I think there's a huge conversation around metrics, like what is a proficient AE and are we allowing sure. them that full bandwidth? Like, sure. are you in this 100% are there still, yep. you're still flanking? And if so, yep. like are other roles able to fill in for those um, before looking at that? So with the salesperson as, as an enablement professional, it's what barriers can I remove? Like, even training can be a barrier at that point. So looking at those type of things and removing those. And then once those are, and we're still hitting that capacity, knowing that that's happening, um, by the time you actually get all of the proof, it's already too late. You're already missing things. So being proactive and looking for the key indicators um, of success and clearly define what that looks like. Like if this, then that, again, it's really kind of looking for that growth and then be careful of where, because if you are growing in a certain area, how does that affect the, the other flanks and, and keeping an eye on those. So growth is fun, but it also can make things break that you didn't intend to break, um, especially when it starts coming to product market fit. So knowing that growing one area is gonna affect the other areas and how does that happen? So do you have enough leads to support two, three, four more SDRs? Do you have enough like qualified opportunities coming through for sales to truly do all those motions? So really looking for those and saying, here are the pillars of success. This is what we're gonna be going towards. Yeah, um, wanted to pause really quick because we had a, a kind of good question here from Adam Seitzman in the, um, in the chat, um, maybe a little bit uh, earlier in the maturity model kind of, uh, as compared to where we're talking about right now, but hiring your first sales employee, should it be an SDR, junior A, your senior A, our, our sales motion is predominantly a PLG, but adding in um, sales led growth now to, to go up market. Um, uh, so that, uh, so first I added, um, I dropped a, you know, a, um, a little chat, uh, a little article here in the chat um, that I wrote for Lenny Richitsky's newsletter on, on layering and sales on top of a self-serve motion or a PLG motion. Um, I think my reaction to what you're describing there is like, should it be a SDR? Should it be a junior AE? What have you? Usually the way that I think about that is like, what is missing in the um, kind of in the founder led sales motion. So I'll give you an example. At my last software company, Talent Bin, the first, th the, the first like additional sales um, talent um, or capacity that I hired was a SDR to kind of fill my calendar. Um, this was back in like 2010, 2011. And then, um, but you know, when I started, you know, started Atrium in 2017, um, I have a, at this point, I have a pretty scaled um, sales operation, sales leadership network. And so it's like pretty easy for me to get customer facing meetings. Um, and, and so as a result, kind of my first hire there was um, a customer success professional. So I didn't need the SDR capability because like just do it myself. Um, instead, what I needed was like customer success capacity as I closed business to have, to be able to hand off to somebody to, to implement, to run with it, et cetera. So the way I would think about it is like what's missing in the, in the motion. And then that's like where you would, would kind of layer that in. Um, so um, back on the maxing out the initial, uh, initial team here. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, you know, Jeff, any kind of commentary on how you know it's time for um, for this phase to kind of go from that initial couple of AEs to, you know, to scaling it up to six, eight, et cetera? Yeah, so I'd say um, to some degree, I would echo what, what Jeremy said, which is that at this point, you should have a pretty good understanding of what your conversion metrics look like at various points of the pipeline for the reps that, you, you know, that, that are working on mm -hmm. your team. You understand you know, where you have gaps or where you don't. And, you know, 
obviously if 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 uh, your reps are start you're starting to see some degradation in the numbers mm -hmm. because they're overworked or they can't handle the opportunities um you can start you know that that's probably when you want to start thinking about this but kind of coming back to what i said initially in the first phase like the unit economics thing uh, part of this never really goes away like as you're continuing to scale you're kind of gradually sprinkling in new folks to test to see if your unit economics will be maintained or, or improved and you know it, i think a big mistake is when people start like really going crazy and, and like doubling and tripling the size of their sales team uh and not doing it in like a gradual or measured fashion where they end up making like massive mistakes um mm. so I, I think that that's you know super important i think the other thing too is you know hopefully you figured this out in the first phase but you need to at least by now understand if you can identify what is your icp your ideal customer profile if you've not yet been able to determine what is the right target customer that you need to be focused on and you can't get narrow on that then you probably are not ready to to start expanding the team you need to get to a point where you found a way to really scale your business in a, in a very efficient way and part of that is coming to a consensus around who is the type of customer that makes sense for us um and like i said if you if you if you cannot determine that at the, at this point you you have more investigative uh research to do before before going any further mm -hmm. yeah i think that's i think that's a really really good point about the narrow focus i think it's funny the name of the game maybe before when it's a founder driven sales or even the first couple of reps you're really discovering where is this product market fit you know you definitely have a sense of the problem space you're working on and obviously a solution that you've been building and folks are potentially using but that can be really broad. There can be many different, you know, even with a very specific persona and type of company problem, it could be, hey, is this a sub hundred company, hundred person company? Is this a hundred to a thousand? Is this enterprise? Even within a very narrow focus of an industry and persona and market and solution. So I think you nailed it, Jeff, in terms of you can't scale unless you can say, hey, we can have X number more people sell into this specific thing, have the same kind of conversation and nail it because market should be big, especially if you're kind of in the world that that we're in and, and likely a lot of folks that are joining in really big markets that you need to nail. You're never going to get that efficiency and that Jeremy has been mentioning unless you can really narrow. And it's so counterintuitive to what you were just doing, right? You're telling this big story. You're at the start of this grain of an idea that can be really big then you kind of need to do the opposite and get super, super narrow. And that's something that has been a really interesting learning experience getting to this point out of cord of, hey, first you can be a lot of things to a lot of different people. You want to get those conversations. You want to get a lot of feedback. Now you don't want that. Now you want to close a lot of deals very narrowly and have very similar types of conversations um, day after day with the folks that you're bringing on because you can't have, you know, you can't have a dozen GMs of a company join and be great salespeople. You need salespeople who can have consistent conversations. So I think that's that's been one of the most interesting learnings that that I've had kind of getting to this stage of the company. And then <clears throat> I, I love like all of that, um, both Jeff and Ross. Um, another thing that you want to think about is like, what are the puzzle pieces? So from that founder led, like knowing where that stops and starts like what's a good flank for that like what's what's a good way to expand that conversation into a more structured organization and you can do that from first sales people first two sales people to now we're going to go to six and what are those puzzle pieces like where are my weaknesses where are my strengths and knowing the type of people you're bringing in to actually slot into those areas that you may be lacking um just have some growth and it really kind of flanks what sales enablement would do later on is really kind of putting that whole pie together. Nice. Um, I, I think probably the thing that um, I would, so the same way that in the last stage we we're talking about making sure that you kind of know what the path through the forest is, so to speak, and kind of you can encode your, um, you know, you can encode your sales motion because like you know what the repeatable recipe is. I think the next step then is because what you've done with those two account executives in the prior stage um, is kind of get a get an understanding of what like a healthy productive rep looks like. It's it's like what is their what does their week look like? How many customer facing meetings is it? You know how many opportunities can they manage concurrently? What is their win rate on those? How many meetings does it take to close a deal? Like because so, what you're doing is one was encoding the the sales motion. The next thing is, is 
what are the hallmarks of a successful like selling like a successful unit of rep if you will because then what like what we're going to do is we're going to use that as like a fingerprint of success to then measure the the next two four six eight because what will happen is very quickly is you'll you'll realize that you can't keep all the reps in your brain you keep two reps in your brain right? It's pretty, and you're probably like on most of their calls with them. Mm-hmm. Um, you get to the point where you have four, you get to the point three, you have six. And like, guess what? You're not going to be on all their calls um, because you're going to be working on other things. And moreover, you're probably going to be onboarding new people <laughs> you hired and like recruiting and interviewing and so on and so forth. So the only way that you're going to be able to effectively manage is going to be to start managing by metric. Um, and that's really the point of like where you can't keep the humans in your brain. You now have to like rely on instrumentation in order to in order to do that. And so the but in order to know what good looks like or what the behaviors look like, you need to have that fingerprinted with those first or two like the, those those first one or two reps. And so that would be my recommendation: would say, hey, like we've got these two reps, we got to understand you know, how many meetings they can have a week, how many opportunities they can manage concurrently without their untouched opportunity counts, like going bananas or like their win rates tanking out or, or what have you, because then like, now we know what that, like that fingerprint looks like. And then we can instrument those incremental reps as we bring them on. So that's what I would, I would recommend there. Um, cool. So like last topic here, and this is where things get spicy. Um, and I think this is where, um, you know, where I think Jeremy has spent a lot of his time um, is when you get to the point where now you're like, <laughs> now you're really cooking with gas, right? Talk about like not being able to keep these, these reps in your brain. And like, this is, it's, it's actually funny. Like this is literally like Atrium's sales organization looks like this right now. Um, maybe a little bit more SDRs, a little bit more AEs. Um, but this is like literally what we, what we look like right now um, where you have multiple layers of management um, on on that team like all the reps are not going into the vp of sales or not going into the you know the business founder or what have you Mm -hmm. um and so if we if we go ahead and flip to the next slide here i think the the second kind of top the the same kind of topic applies here which is like hey how do you know that you're ready for you know for this phase right here and um and like what are the things that you really should look out for and and so jeremy is the person who kind of spends has spent the most time in organizations of of this scale i would love to start with start with you what would your kind of recommendations be here uh regarding when you know it's ready to get that big you know scale up like that and then also what are the big tripwires to look out for uh, it's small problem turned into a big problem so <clears throat> yeah and and everything that we talked about previously is going to start having this and hopefully you just are are cooking at a higher velocity. Um, It's what is repeatable. And again, if we know this, then we can do that. If you're not putting all of those in place early on, which is why I'm talking about documentation, um, before even a sales enablement team comes on to the property and really kind of assesses everything. If people aren't allowed to be curious and know how to solve some of those needs of where they can strengthen themselves, um, it, it's going to start falling flat. So making sure that you have a structure in place to be able to support this type of growth and start the layering process that happens with them. Um, but also looking at core jobs for each of those. Are we allowing people to do their core jobs? If you're having a VP manage three different layers of teams, Mm -hmm. um, are they doing core job? Like, are we looking at what that that means? Um, The same with direct line managers. Like, what is it that they can do at that point? And you start, again, forgetting people's names in in that process. Mm -hmm. And are you able to start lifting them and growing those people? So... Um, there, there's a couple things that come into play because it's no longer a one-on few, it's a one-on mini. And how are you able to support that one-on mini and looking at those? So it's not just the hiring motions, but mm-hmm. is your company ready to take that next step? Are you yeah. ready to scale that out? Do you have the support? Do you have the technology? Do you have the tools, the documentation? Um, that's, those are the biggest things that I look 
to go in and solve. I start with an audit joining the company, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of what the role is, and really start looking at the the behaviors and the struggles. Um, again, my primary focus is to keep people in their core jobs as much as possible. And what are the barriers that are in the way of doing that? So if yeah. they don't know how to use their tech stack, if they don't know how to find information, those are all barriers for them being as productive as they can be. Right. Um, Jeff, I don't know how much time you've spent in organizations at this at this scale. Do you have anything to, to add there? No, I mean, um, I would say that at this point, you have a pretty good idea of like the number of accounts that a rep can handle. You have an idea of what your unit economics are. I, I would also just point out that sometimes it's a, it's a forcing function for this growth because you'll have like product development um, that might force this type of growth. Or if you're vertically focused and you want to start moving into other verticals, you want to start experimenting with verticals you've not been selling into. And when that happens, you know, unfortunately, the, the, the answer I give is kind of underwhelming. You kind of just do this all over again. Like you're, as you keep expanding um, vertically, um, you're, you're not like necessarily doing anything different than what you did at the beginning. You're, you're kind of running a new business within the business and the, per, and the person you hire to, to lead that team is somebody again, who's going to be, you know, knowing that they're coming in with a, lot, a level of uncertainty is going to get their hands dirty to do a lot of research and prove product market fit and that scale can exist within the vertical that they've been hired to to grow right and so in a lot of ways you need to kind of look at as you're growing you just need to keep looking at these as compartmentalized businesses within the business and not overcomplicate things too much the things that worked for you at the beginning will continue to work for you as you grow if you think about it in much the same way ross i, I mean obviously your organization is um Actually, I mean, you saw this as Stripe when you were very early seller at Stripe and then scaled mm -hmm. up pretty meaningful. And I, I think at this point, you you guys at, at Accord, I mean, we're kind of a fancy customer of Accord, but like we're not nearly as fancy. Some of your fancy, fancy customers, you know, with their, uh, <laughs> I think you have a number of customers that are at this at this level or even higher. Um, what have you kind of seen or is like really important for, for making sure that organizations can be successful at this level of um, abstraction and, and scale? Yeah, I think this is, this is probably a, a significantly harder inflection point than the previous one we talked about. I think, you know, going from founder to a couple of folks, honestly, is if you hire the right people, it's like a breath of fresh air. It's you're still close to everything. You have other really flexible people. You're able to accelerate a lot of things that you know you should have been doing, but you just couldn't from a resource perspective. The next step, I think you have some growing pains. You have, you know, a larger team. Maybe the person, the founder, or you know, kind of first go-to-market person that was relatively senior at the company um, gets a bit further away from being on a lot of the calls and getting really close. And you kind of rely on that that next person. And but this level, Dick, you're much further away. Well, that you know, the person that had been the probably driving a lot of the understanding of the end customer and really the pulse on the market is really far at this level. And I think you rely on both really, really, really good hiring as well as great management, which is super challenging if you're at a high growth company. Um, I think it's really, really hard to both make the hires from the frontline folks as well as that leader and now potentially these middle leaders, as well as do what Jeremy mentioned, which is build out the right documentation and stuff to scale. I think that there's inevitably a lot of breakage there, whether it's from the, how you've hired and enabled the reps, whether it's those leaders that start to get stretched in ways that maybe they haven't before. And just, you know, like Jeff mentioned as well, like going into new segments and testing new things out, you kind of got to repeat a lot of the stuff that you needed to do as an earlier stage company, which you're just further away from probably those types of people that have figured it out before. So I think this is actually like one of the most difficult. I think once you've cracked this one, then you can really start to scale exponentially a lot more easily, maybe to that 50, 60, 100 plus rep range. And then you probably go through another transition where it's like really, really big. But this, this kind of stage to a bit longer, I think is easier, but getting to this point, really, really challenging. Again, I think it really goes back to some of the people some of the people stuff and some of that core enablement and documentation that you know easily gets skipped over. So that's that's kind of what I've seen from also being on the front lines of this. Um, it's it's a challenging, growing pain at, at a company. Yeah, actually, it's a different type person. 
Yeah. Like if you're everyone becomes different, right? What yeah. you need before for those two stages is actually very different than this one. Yeah. Well, you're looking for those scrappy individuals that can do whatever it takes to get the job done. Like they're just willing to wear whatever hat on any given day. And then as you start getting into repeatable processes and things that you yeah. can scale, it's just a different human that starts coming in there. And then you have to keep looking over your shoulder and making sure the culture is, is staying there in place. So you grow too fast and have to do some type of layoff culture. Like you always have to keep an eye over your shoulder and make sure that you're staying true to whatever that North Star was. Yeah, I, I think the the thing I would um, recommend to folks on, on this front is once you start, um, like we were talking about making sure that you're you knew what the path through the forest, you knew what the recipe was the time before, right? Um, and that tells you that you have the right to scale to, um, you know, to, to a couple of top couple of reps. The next thing, of course, is that then you have to say, hey, what does a successful rep look like in terms of like, what is their week to week behavior and kind of like, what does their successful metrics look like? Because then that allows us to scale to the next, the next step there, which is like four, six, eight account executives. What happens then is you now have to, like before we were documenting the, the sales motion, then we were documenting like what a rep ought to look like, like metrically, behaviorally. Now what you really have to make sure of, because you're gonna be breaking teams apart, um, you need to do a really good job of having good operating rhythm um, structures. And so what that means is like, this is our sales team meeting. And like, this is the agenda that we go through along with like all the supporting reporting and dashboarding and what have you. And, and this is our daily standup. And, you know, each team has it together. And like, these are the topics that, that happen in that. And then, oh, and then this is what a one-on-one -on -one looks like, right? And these are the supporting assets uh, associated with that. And they happen this frequently. And there's a document associated with that. And it's tied to these relevant, you know, these relevant metrics or what have you. And, oh, and by the way, this is what a pipe review looks like. Um, and just making sure that that, like, it's, it's essentially a bit, instead of it being a sales motion recipe it's a sales organization recipe um and and so because otherwise what you're going to end up with and we see this in our customers you see it's really fascinating we'll have like these customers um with atrium where they'll have like four teams of like you know six or eight mid-market reps and they're co they're co selling to exactly the same markets totally like you know it's total a b test and the different teams will have very different metrics like the win rates will be different on this team over here versus over here, which of course is like, what the heck is going on here? And really what it is, it's just a different in like management there. So making sure that you're providing the managers, and this is something that we see quite a bit is that an organization will bring in Jeremy in and like, you know, he's busier than like a one like a kickboxer trying to fix all the issues associated with enablement, the managers kind of get overlooked. And so um, actually if you jump back a slide here, um, this is why one of the things that we talk about is how it's really important to like empower those managers. One was with that recipe, but then also with like, you know, tooling and also like education as well. And so this is why we're one of the things that we do is like both the prospects and also to the, to our customers who just like, like this, is where, this is where Sendoso comes in, is giving them, making sure that they have the, the tooling to be able to interpret metrics for, you know, for their team and like be able to, um, you know, to be an effective data-driven sales manager. Because otherwise, if you're just like throwing your managers to the wolves, um, it's, you know, it's not going to be, you're going to end up with those situations where you're like, this team over here has like wildly different, like this team is having like 30% fewer customer facing meetings than these other three teams over here, like WTF, like that shouldn't happen. Yep. <laughs> right. I, um, I love that. It's the first thing that I go in and teach, like uh, as a one person team at this point in my life, the strength that I can give is turning the direct line managers into true coaches and knowing what each, the purpose of each meeting is. Um, all of that is exactly what I go in and that's how I get power at the beginning until I can build it's all the really cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It's deputization. Wonderful. Well, um, I think we're all, um, we're all wrapped up here. Any kind of kind of parting wisdom for folks before, uh, maybe we can pop to the next slide here. Um, we have a number of resources that, um, um, that I think we've been dropping to folks here. Um, we'll go ahead and send these out afterwards. Um, uh, Jeff, Jeremy, any sort of uh, any parting wisdom before we uh, we send everybody on their merry way to their uh, their next meeting where they're gonna get the get the docu sign signed. 
I'll invoke real quick, you know, Paul Graham, I, I think uh, from Y Combinator who said like in, in the in the early days, you need to do things that don't scale. Sure. Um, and obviously, as you scale, you need to do things that do scale, right? And so don't be yep. afraid to iterate and experiment at the beginning. Don't worry about that at the beginning. Um, that's something that I think a lot of people miss. Yep. Jeremy? Yeah, it, it, the whole point is to build. So look at your actions, everything that you say, everything that you do, is it building to a greater? Um, that's that's what I always look back on. Is this destructive or constructive? So always remember to build in every conversation, every email, everything that you're doing. Wonderful. And then Ross? Um, yeah, I think uh, what Jeff said honestly really, really resonated with me is at the very beginning, you don't want to be doing things that scale because yep. you need to figure it out first. And if you're thinking about that, you're never going to figure out the hard stuff. And then you can't keep doing that. And that's the big challenge of startups is it's this constant cycle. And then again, to get to that next step jump and exponential growth, you kind of got to go back and figure out the next big product or segment or market or something like that. So uh, that that really resonated with me, Pete. Wonderful. Cool, folks. Well, thank you for joining us. We'll do this again in a, you know, in a month or so with a, you know, with a, an, another slate of amazing, um, you know, early stage sales thinkers. Uh, Jeff, Jeremy, you guys were super awesome. Thank you for dropping all the knowledge. Really appreciate it. And everybody will send the recording out afterwards um, to, to folks and all, also all the offers that were being dropped. So have a great day, everyone. Everyone.